I was feeling this call to travel. I was feeling this call to definitely be my own boss. And I'm like, no, there has to be another way to get to where I want to go that's not the traditional route. I think a lot of people have those moments in their careers where they basically are told you're not cut out for this and it's a moment where they decide, all right, am I not cut out for this? Or it's kind of like a show you, like, a few moments. You're listening to the From Here to Wear podcast. From Here to Wear is a community of goal getters and dream chasers. We're transitioning into our 20s, first jobs, scary bosses, talking all things from sex, dating, relationships, wellness, to networking and finances, the ups, the downs, and everything in between. These interviews are bundled with the tips and tricks you definitely didn't learn in school, hearing from those who have come before us, helping us navigate from here to where. On this episode, we hear from Allie Pierce, Emmy award-winning journalist, travel content creator, and founder of Allie Abroad. She has traveled to more than 30 countries and creates literally the coolest travel destination guides and videos. But when she's not jet setting to countries and cities you've never heard of, she's the host of Clickish, a digital showcast that shares the stories of successful female entrepreneurs and content creators. Beyond that, she's my mentor, dear friend, and soul sister. But what really connects us is that we've had extremely similar career paths that have followed along the same lines, but just a few years apart. We both went through the broadcast journalism school at the University of Missouri, and we worked at the same TV station in Palm Springs, California, both as TV reporters and weekend morning anchors. In this episode, we dive into the behind the scenes of what it's like to get a degree in broadcast journalism and what it takes to work in local news as a TV reporter and anchor. And then coming to terms with chasing your dreams and changing your dreams, what it's like to have a quarter life crisis, realize you're kind of unhappy or feeling burnt out in a career, then flipping your world upside down by using your degree for something else other than what you originally set out to do. We go from career advice to travel advice to what it takes to create a brand online, being authentic on Instagram, and how to gain a following organically through genuine connection. Plus, we hear lots of other good tips and tricks about life and relationships and so much more. So grab a glass of wine or an extra large cup of coffee and get ready to hear one of my favorite episodes yet. Okay, we want to connect the dots of how you got to where you are because so many people would kill to have that list of credentials, but you kind of had like this crazy, twisted, all over the place way of getting here. So fill us in. (laughs) Ready? Go. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, Okay, so I guess I would start... I mean, how far back do you want to go? Probably not to the years of me wanting to be a professional backup dancer. That's where I thought I was going to be right now. (laughs) I was supposed to be touring all over the world with Beyonce. Um, Actually, well, to be specific, Justin Timberlake. um, I saw him in concert and I literally looked at his backup dancers and I was like, that's going to be me one day. But (laughs) I see myself. I was like, I see myself doing that. And then I like had a come to Jesus moment where my mom had to sit me down. and She's like, let's pick a career that's a little bit more sustainable for you. And then, like, I went through this weird phase of, like, trying to figure out what the heck I was doing. And honestly, I landed on broadcast journalism. And I spoke with this I, – I this is so wild. I spoke with this, like, career coach in high school. But she was also kind of like a psychic. And wow. she was kind of, like, going around, like, the circuit of all the other dance moms that we kind of all knew in the group. And this one mom was like, hey – how about you talk to, I don't even remember this lady's name, but she asked me all these strange questions, weird things. Like, do you have stuff under your bed? Do you like to make lists? Like psychic, it's it just weird questions that didn't even make sense. And she landed on broadcast journalists because I liked to perform. I liked to write. I like to be creative. And so that's kind of like, I don't know how she pulled that out of thin air, but that's like where we landed. And to be honest, like it fits. It fits, thankfully, but I was clueless. Like, I thought a broadcast journalist was a person who sat down in front of a camera, they got their hair and makeup done, and they read off the teleprompter. 
Like, that's what I thought that job was. Yeah, literally. Literally. I was like, this is so great. I'm going to, you know, be like this, I don't know, the next Katie Couric or Juliana Rancic or whatever you think when you're in high school. Mm -hmm. And so then we went through, like, picking out what colleges I would go to. Obviously landed at Mizzou, which is our connection. Our connection. Went to the same college. Yes. The greatest place in the world. Take me back. Oh, my God. Um, But... So Mizzou has an incredible journalism school, as you know, and thank God for that because it was really there that I realized, okay, this is what a journalist is. Like it's maybe 20% that glamorous kind of side of things. And then the 80% is hard work and it's, but it's good hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real importance and a real purpose to that kind of work. And I really, as I'm sure you remember doing, like we were in it in college. We were working at a NBC affiliate station that was owned by the university, getting to be on camera, getting to report stories as college students. And that was really where I was like, wow, I love this. I love having a new thing to do every single day, having a new person to talk to, having, I don't know, just kind of having a variety in my day rather than Mm -hmm. just sitting at a desk. It's not the typical nine to five. You could be interviewing the governor or a homeless person. Like really, you have to be able to speak to anyone, do anything on a deadline. Like we learned. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's good though, because you get idiots like me who come to Mizzou and think that I'm just going to be a pretty face sitting down in front of a camera. And then that's what makes or breaks people. And you have really incredible teachers who kind of tell you, yo, you're not cut out for this. And that's a hard conversation that I don't think a lot of college kids get. And and maybe that's a whole conversation of whether a teacher should be telling you that or not. But um, I think I, so. Yeah. Save people a lot of time. And a lot of money and a lot of, a whole lot of other things. But truly, I think that like, I learned that this was the career for me. And, you know, just to kind of speed things up a little bit, after that, I knew I also didn't want to do hard news. Yeah. I didn't, I was not the first person raising my hand when there was breaking news, when there was a shooting, when there was a fire. I was literally hiding under the desk or strategically going to the bathroom at the time when they were picking people to do this stuff because I was like, yo, this is not for me. I want to be on the red carpet interviewing celebrities, talking about, I don't know, like events or fun, fluffy, girly things that Mm -hmm. I was interested in. And there is an importance of hard news. And, you know, God bless the people who do those careers because it is hard work. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to California. California or bust. Like, that's where Hollywood is. I'm going to work at a a small TV station out there, and I'm going to make it in Hollywood eventually working in Los Angeles. So what I did was I— After graduation, I basically only wanted to take a job at a small local TV station in California. So I booked a trip, a ticket to, I believe it was, I don't know if I, yeah, I flew into San Francisco and then I met with TV stations all the way from San Francisco to Monterey to San Luis Obispo down to Southern California and just met with news directors and was like, here's my stuff. What do you think? Like, I might be looking for a job. Let's kind of start a conversation. And what was their reaction? Um, so (laughs) you're like, uh, uh, it's actually really funny. This was like kind of a really big turning point in my career. There was the first station that I met with was someone who was also a Mizzou grad graduate and he was Mizzou Mafia mm -hmm. alumni connection supposed to be really tight knit yes and you know they're kind of supposed to look out for you especially like new graduates not to say that they should of course just hand you a job but at least have a conversation or kind of you know have that rapport so he was a news director and I won't say what station but I met with him and he basically said I don't have what it takes to make it in this industry I don't I am too fluffy I am not basically not cut out. And this was the first meeting I had with any kind of after graduation. After graduation. Like, I already like, got the degree. Then this is what I'm doing. <laughs> I was like, and I mean, to be fair, my real, what we graduate with this, like kind of like re- our version of a resume. I mean, it's laughable. Like, let's put that in the show notes. I think it would be so funny to see like what the I heck I was. To. Yeah. I'll Link, find that. Okay. It's, Swipe. No. It's so funny. So to be fair, it wasn't the greatest thing ever, but he should have never like kind of take that, taken that moment to 
tear me apart. I just, it was a, it was a definitely a growing moment and I fought back tears the entire time. And I finally got out to my car and had like a nice little cry, called my mom. I was like, what am I doing? Am I not cut out for this? And I knew that I was, and really a full circle moment was, I would say six months. No, not even six months after that. A couple months after that, I was working as a freelance reporter in San Luis Obispo and the same person called and wanted to hire me from that station. The same person who said same you're not cut out said for I it. wasn't cut out for it. Wanted to hire me, and of course I said no, not interested because you know, I don't know when you. I think what's really important is working for someone that you believe in, really having kind of a boss that you admire, you have a connection of, with, and you are excited to work for. Absolutely, and so that was you know, that was an interesting moment. And I kind of feel like that's, I think a lot of people have those moments in their careers where they basically are told you're not cut out for this. And it's a moment where they decide, all right, am I not cut out for this? Or it's kind of like a show you like a few moments. <laughs> no, I, I've had those moments too, where you get off the phone with someone or you have an, an encounter with someone and yet you have the breakdown moment where you're crying. But I think it's like you pull yourself up mm-hmm. and you're like, how can I learn from this? Mm-hmm. And how can I move on? And no, I am good enough. I am, I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. But like, thank you for that kick in the ass, but I'm going to keep going. Absolutely. Looking back at that, it takes a lot of grit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes a lot of perseverance. People telling you that you're not cut out for it. Mm-hmm. The stuff, the place where we worked in college, I feel like, oh my gosh, that is where you really learn a lot of the skills and you are doing stuff that your peers aren't doing because you're waking up at three in the morning Mm -hmm. and you're putting on your parka and you're doing a live hit at 4 a.m. on a newscast when your friends are still at the bars drinking (laughs) because we're just so steadfast on this goal of like, this is what we want to do. And you and I both have had that same aspiration for so long. And then we had the job and then we kind of had this like, quarter life crisis, mm-hmm. different reasons for both of us. But okay, let's go back to your first job before we go to mm-hmm. like kind of how before it's we spiraled. are to now. Yeah. yeah. What I admire about you so much and why you're one of my mentors is because mm-hmm. you're so hardworking. And so you had this amazing job. Let's talk about this because the first job you've done, you know, the internships, the networking, the uncomfortable stuff mm-hmm. in college in order to get you a job. So mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that moment when you weren't the intern anymore and it was the real deal when you were working in Palm Springs at the news station? Yeah. um, It was one of those moments where you realize, okay, there's no more slip ups. Like there's no more time for mistakes. And I mean, again, not to harp too much on college, but they really instilled like there's no such thing as a misspelling. Like if you made one misspelling on your college paper in journalism school, you got a zero. And so that kind of brought me to where I was working at the TV station, holding yourself to a really high standard. And also just knowing that like, this is, this is kind of like your opportunity, your chance to really prove yourself. And I think for whatever industry you're in, whether you're in journalism, you're in business, you're in whatever, that first job is no joke and it is hard and you are going to be pushed to your limits. And I honestly think it needs to be that way because you grow and you become the person you are and you understand the field that you're in. And you, I look at it, I look at your first job, especially in journalism, like that's your master's. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of like your real life training. And so I don't know. I think, I think it was just an interesting place to be in, but I would not have traded it for the world because it made me the person that I am today. You know, talk about what surprised you or maybe what was hard for you and how you how you overcame those kinds of things? I think it was, uh, I guess it was just the weird situations that you find yourself thrown into and just really having to kind of navigate it. I mean, at the end of the day, you have a deadline that's five or six o'clock newscast and whatever you have is what goes on air. And so I think navigating that and then also, I don't know, for me, it was so hard pitching stories. Like when you're new to a community, I'm not sure how in the weeds you want to get with this, but um, for reporters, like you are an expert in that area. And so you want to make sure that you're connecting with the mayors, you're connecting with the city leaders, and you're really getting a pulse for what's going on in the community. And so when you're new, you have, you're have you literally dropped down in a you're a city. transplant. You have no idea who is who, who, where's exactly. what. Exactly. And so I think for me, that was the biggest challenge was really kind of getting to know 
the area. And, and what I would say for, I don't know, people, especially in the journalism industry, especially in the TV industry, but really any, any industry, when you're new to a place and you're in a new job, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Like I remember mm-hmm. this was some advice that I got from, I, it was probably Stacy, but it might've been someone else at Mizzou where they said, you know, when you're new to a community, you get the mayors of all the different cities emails, or at least someone within the city and you start meeting with business leaders and you're just having coffee. You're literally just introducing yourself and you're sitting down and you're finding out what the problems are, what's going on in the community, how you can help just kind of getting to know what's going on. And you do on. that on your free time, by the way. Let's yeah, see. oh yeah. You're not doing that during your, your, your normal, reporting day. Really quick, so I could break down this down, but I want you to, mm-hmm. I mean, we both can add here and there, but describe a day in the life of a news reporter because some yeah. people, it is laughable when people <laughs> say, oh, you write your own things yeah. and you edit your own things. Wait, you're not just like, showing up and doing the yeah. news, like, uh, no, 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 back up. So for those people who don't know, like, what is a day in the life? It's so funny to like really put myself back in that because I've been out of it for a year. And so, okay, but man, we were living and breathing it. So it shouldn't be that hard to remember. But so my day would start, I would get up around, I don't, I was an early riser. I'd get up around like seven in the morning, get all my stuff done, breakfast, work out if I was being good. And then I would turn on GMA and I would have the news playing in the background so that I was listening to like top stories or what's going on in the world, just being educated while I'm getting ready or doing my thing around the house. Then If you're a great reporter, (laughs) you've already got like some sort of idea, but I was not the greatest reporter. I could definitely admit that, especially when it came to local hard news. And so you're, I'm looking on like CNN for maybe health related stories. Like let's say there's a Zika outbreak and you know, the viewers want to know, okay, what, what do I need to be concerned about? How do I protect myself? Yeah. So you're thinking of stories that really relate to your local community and you're doing that before or you're at work. So that work started for us at 10 a.m. We had our morning pitch meeting. And so you all, everyone goes into this conference room. You all sit around a big desk and you all pitch your ideas. Conference room or firing squad. <laughs> either way, it. either way, felt very much like a firing squad. Um, it became, as I worked at the station longer, it became laughable. It's like, all right, what the hell is Allie going to pitch today? Because it was a joke. I like cats. It was literally like, what is it going to be? Some crazy cat fashion show? Like it was, it, it became comical. So, but when I was starting, I was trying to be so serious and, you know, really come up with really good story ideas. And so you pitch and basically your news director or your producers kind of get to say, uh, if, and this is if you're a reporter. They say, yeah, we like this story. We really think you should go after this. And everyone has a different idea. So it's just pulling ideas together and deciding what gets covered that day. What's going to be the news? What mm-hmm. will be on the 5 and 6 o'clock newscast? Yep. So you have from 10 a.m. until your first live hit at 5 p.m. to get everything. Get everything. And you are immediately after you get out of that meeting, you're calling people, you're you know making phone calls, setting up interviews, and... Most of the time, you're doing this on your own. So you've got your own gear. You've got everything that you pack up and you leave and you go and do your interviews. Tripod, camera, two phones, one personal, one work phone. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I was so bad with the work phone. I never answered that thing. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, that was difficult. Or God forbid you are in the bathroom or something and you miss a call. Man, oh Oh my gosh. bad. Um, so you'd go out, you would do your interviews, you would, um, you know, you're miking up the person, you're thinking about the questions and all the while you're kind of thinking about how the story comes together. Let's say you don't have someone you can set an interview up. You're knocking on doors. You're going literally my go-to place was the Trader Joe's parking lot. And I would ambush people as they're walking out with their groceries and be like, please, please. I have a story about back to school, uh, shots and I, I want your opinion on it. Like, and you just kind of hope and pray that people are like, have some, sympathy? I don't know, sympathy for you. Pity. <clears throat> Pity. And are like, who's this crazy lady who wants to talk to me? And hopefully like women are like, I don't have any makeup on. I don't want to talk to you. And I'm like, girl, you look fine. Put your sunglasses on. <laughs> oh my gosh. How many times You're just like to me? cajoling them to like, please get an interview. I and, need an interview. Right. Yeah. And so once you've got all the elements of your story, then you need to bring it back over to the station or you work from your car and you're writing your scripts, you're, you know, piecing together the entire piece to make this video that's usually about a minute 30 and that's what makes it on air. And sometimes depending on kind of the legs of the story, 
your producers or your bosses will decide if you need to go live before that or if they want you in the studio so you can talk to the anchors about this piece and have kind of a back and forth. Another thing, digital first, which is so important. So web story, tweeting, Facebook Live, Mm -hmm. also catching up to speed. Another thing, being a transplant to a new city. This is a follow-up on a court case that has been ongoing and all of a sudden becoming a master in all of the characters in the story, who did what, what year this happened, researching and becoming Mm -hmm. an expert in a day on something. I found that to be super challenging. And then, you know, let's throw a wrench in all of this. Breaking news happens and all that work that you've set up and all those interviews. Bye. You're done. Pulled out of that. Go to the fire. Figure it out. What's going on? Live shot right now. Five, six, six thirty, whatever. You know, actually, we need you to stay until the lates. Like, so all of the work that you do up until that point could be not scrapped. I mean, maybe you use it the next day. Maybe you don't. But, you know, you're, I think what for me was the hardest was I felt so not in control of my yeah. day, of my work, of my mm-hmm. life in general, you know? And especially when you're getting phone calls at 3.30 in the morning saying, hey, we need you to get to the studio because, you know, someone called in sick and we need you on air in 30 minutes. Like, it's it's a jarring experience. And, and for me, it was just, I wanted more control. Yeah. I wanted a little bit more control. But I think I commend everyone who is in this mm-hmm. industry because I think it's so important. Yeah. Um, that was just, it sounded like a rant that we were having. Yeah, I it mean, was. It was It was a rant. It was a little cathartic. I'm not going to lie. It was. You just got to like let it out of your system. But you know what? Truly, it's it was a great, great job. It was a great job and it brought us together and it brought, you know, so much experience. And I can never, I I. If I were able to go back and do things over, I wouldn't do it any different. Me too. Oh, for sure. I am so grateful for that experience because you know what hard work looks like. Definitely. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's no, you learn by fire and I'm so grateful for being pushed and pushed and pushed because you know that you can do it. are now on this path that you are so passionate about. And I think that speaks to so many things because if the passion isn't there, like it doesn't matter what job it is. And I think this is another thing. It doesn't matter how much money you're making. If you are unhappy, literally quit that job Mm. now. Mm -hmm. Life is way, way too short to be in a job that you dread waking up for. And so now I feel like the reason you're getting that positive, positive feedback is because you're just so happy and you're actually doing finally what you love, which is fantastic. So how did you segue into that? What are you doing now? Like, tell us about this new phase that you're in. Yeah, it's kind of, it's honestly so wild. And I feel like I, I've described it before as like, you know, when your your car is out of control and you're like literally like trying to take the wheel and like, skrr, like turn it around, like what's happening? Like, I feel like that's exactly kind of what I did with my career. And it's funny, like, you know, towards the end of my contract, um, I started just having this pull where it was like, this isn't it. Like, this isn't, I'm towards the end, to be completely honest, I was crying every day. I was going to work. I was extremely unhappy. And, Mm, um, and I was like, this is not life. As you just said, like life is too short to be, you know, dreading going into work. And so I had already known at that point in time that I wanted to do something a little bit different. And for me, it was like, I always thought I was going to work for E! News and like be interviewing celebrities on the red carpet. Like that was my ultimate goal. I wanted to be Juliana Rancic. Like that was it. I, I think a lot of people probably had that same dream. Mm-hmm. And and then I came to the realization of like, wait, I don't watch like these Beverly Hills housewife shows. I don't, and not to, I mean, hell, I love me a good Kim Kardashian moment, but like I am not entrenched in this world where I could talk about it for days. But what I could talk about for days was travel. Mm -hmm. And this was, I mean, I'm pretty sure you studied abroad in college, didn't you? Uh, I actually was going to. I was totally enrolled to go to Barcelona. Yeah. And the day I put down a non-refundable $500 deposit, I got a call from... NBC Washington in DC. And so I had this poll of like, do I go study abroad? I know, and so we have these hard decisions. I chose journalism and I'm really glad I did because Barcelona will always be there. And I'm sure I missed out on some amazing opportunities. It'll and, always be there. You can go back. Yeah. But travel that, is so I've traveled a lot with my yeah. family though. So yeah. and as have you, your mom's a travel agent. So. Yeah. And so like the study abroad in college was really kind of what sparked my travel. And then my mom, as you said, she's a travel agent. So as I was working in this career, I was seeing her go to places like Bhutan 
Bhutan and India and Africa and a bunch of places Not in Europe. Not the average Hawaii. No, no. Like she was going all over the place. And I'm like, wow, I want to do that. But it's not exactly feasible when you work a career, especially in TV where you, I mean, your butt needs to be in that anchor seat. Like if you're gone for a month out of the year, people are like, yo, where's Allie? What's she doing? I mean, I'd be living the life in Italy or something, but <laughs> it wasn't ex- it wasn't exactly a, a job where you could just kind of take off whenever you wanted to. So I was feeling this call to travel. I was feeling this call to mm-hmm. definitely be my own boss, yep. which sounds so fun and, and it is, but it's also a whole nother can of worms. But you're either an entrepreneur or you work for one. So. Uh-huh, exactly. So I was like, you know what? And and the problem was, was I wanted to do all of these things while I was still working at the TV station, but I simply couldn't. And um, I was like, you know what? It's either I go down the path that I thought I was going to go down or I make this huge pivot and test it out and see if it works. And it's so funny because when I thought I wanted to go to LA after this and I was meeting with agents and I was meeting with, you know, executives and and different like uh, production companies and stuff like that. And it was just the same thing every single time. You're too young. You don't have enough experience. It's not a right fit just yet. Come back, go work in Iowa and a bunch of other little TV stations. Pay your dues, pay your dues, pay your dues. Right. And I'm like, no, there has to be another way to get to where I want to go that's not the traditional route. So like all all of those doors were closing in the traditional path that I thought I was going to take. And then there was this travel side of things where I would just take random coffee meetings and you know, an opportunity would pop up and then I would meet someone else and then another opportunity would pop up and all this stuff that I really didn't totally like meet with these people with the intention of getting a job, it all kind of fell into place. Mm -hmm. And I kind of take that as like a sign from the universe where like, all right, this thing that I thought I was supposed to be doing, it wasn't happening. And this other thing that I really kind of feel passionate about, everything was just happening how it was supposed to. And there was really no resistance. And so that's kind of where I find myself right now. You are so incredible. You have like all of this experience. Tell me about what your next thing is of Mm -hmm. what you're doing. So that's incredible that you are now choosing something that you're passionate about, but explain what is a show cast? (laughs) Also your blog, it's just incredible. Side note, okay, how it's grown so much. And I also want to talk about this too, about being authentic Mm -hmm. on social media and all Mm -hmm. that. But really quick, explain, you know, what are you doing now? Okay. So I honestly, this has been the hardest thing is figuring out what the heck my job title is. Like, you know, I've got a travel blog. I have my Instagram. I, you know, work as an on-camera freelance host for, you know, tourism boards and hotels and stuff like that. And then I also just literally um, launched with this incredible company, Clickish, um, what we're calling a showcast. And so it's basically a half talk show, half podcast where I interview some incredible incredible female content creators. And the space is really, you know, what Clickish is all about is educating our community of women, how to build a brand, how to grow their business, how to monetize their platform. It's just a space where people who at any point of your content creation career can go to Clickish and kind of get the resources that you want. So mm-hmm. this show cast is kind of a an arm of that where like, you know, we all have our idols in this industry and we all have these women that we look up to and we're like, how the heck did she do it? And so this is literally my version of like, all right, I'll sit down with her. I'll ask her how she did it. And then maybe her journey and her story, which I'm sure is not a straight line. Like we all love to believe that everyone's path is, Mm -hmm. um, can help all of the women who are in our community and and tuning into this. So we are, uh, we're planning to kind of right now we're interviewing women in Chicago, but we want this to be kind of like an around the country type thing and really just talk around the world. Heck why not? Oh my gosh. You know what? Why the heck not? I am Go here for it. Interview one of those influencers in Amsterdam. They're so cute. I oh love- my God. What's her name? Oh my God. Ningen or something. I don't even know. Nagan. Yeah. Oh, we don't even know how to I say your name, but you're awesome. She's great. I love you, girl. And your cute dog. I mean, dang. <laughs> Kay so- Sutherland. I don't know her. She's an Instagram. She's an actual model, not an Instagram model. Oh There's so many girls. So many people. It's so cool. But actually what I love to see behind these most of them, I can't speak for everyone, mm-hmm. 
these girls are beautiful, but they're also really smart. And mm-hmm. they're doing, oh my God, quigs, quigly, educational materials. Oh, she is absolute goals. And that's, I think, what we're seeing in this industry now. Like, you know, this, it's still, everyone likes to call it the wild, wild west. And I do believe it is because it's such a new industry. But like for a while, it worked to just take a beautiful photo in a beautiful location and literally put a hashtag like goals. You know, that's it. And now I think we're so disillusioned to the whole idea of like, everything's fake online. Everything's, you know, it's a ruse. You're selling me a product, whatever, which that's another Before topic. hashtag ad came out, you were like, oh, this tea, maybe. <laughs> You're yeah. like, yeah, we won't name names, but is the tea really making me skinny? I don't know. Um, but so I love how it's a shift now to all these women who are, not everyone, but a lot of women are doing it, especially Quigley, which you and I really look up to her. But, you know, she's taking beautiful photos, but she's also giving her community tips and really mm-hmm. encouraging them to connect and take it offline and, you know, really actually make a connection. And it's not just everyone's so concerned about growing, 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 like how do I beat the algorithm, like all this stuff, but why not just look at it as like, hey, I've made a new friend today. And like, now I have this new friend who's lives in, you know, Australia and we met through Instagram and now we talk and- And you've actually met up with some of your friends in person that you meet online, which is even cooler. I would encourage people to do that. They're, oh my gosh, like these girls. I met um, my friend Mary who just happened to be in New York at the same time as me. And we literally just connected- online and on Instagram. And we both were in the same city at the same time. And we're like, let's meet up. And it's important to take it off your phone screen because you just get so like, I don't know, bogged down in there. And then we were all these weird robots who are just like typing little like captions back to each other when you could just sit down and have a normal conversation face to face. And that was kind of, I think the point of social media when it started, it's Mm -hmm. kind of gone out of control and spiraled into different ways that no one could have ever imagined when they first created it. Yeah. But I think that's so important. Yeah. Taking it offline and to be authentic. And Mm -hmm. what I think what you're doing and these other big time influencers are doing with educational materials Mm -hmm. and social media, putting your soul and your heart into Mm -hmm. it and your passion, doing things that others aren't doing. I think that's fantastic. But I mean, talk about your learning curve and that experience, because when you started this, you did notice maybe some dark sides of this and it's still happening. It's still going on on social media. But for someone who is an influencer, you know, explain what you noticed and what you didn't like about it and how you want to kind of brighten that space up with what you're doing. I think that, I mean, there's so many different kind of directions to take this, but I think, you know, everyone kind of falls into the comparison route. And Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's really hard to not look online and see, you know, I mean, it still happens to me. And I I look at all these other girls who are taking these incredible trips and, you know, it looks so, you know, glamorous. Mm -hmm. And you start to question yourself. You're like, well, what am I doing? I don't, I want that. I want to do that. And I think it needs to totally shift and it needs to be more about being really excited for other women and and knowing yeah. that there is enough for all of you because we all have that scarcity mindset of thinking like, oh, what? I mean, do there, is there really a need for another travel blog? And I, I actually was just having this conversation with a dear friend yesterday where she was like, should I put this out into the world? She's like kind of creating a space, another kind of similar to Clickish, like a, a resource for women to come and connect in events and that sort of thing. And she's like, does the world need this? And And I was like, Yes, of course, because I think with the mindset of scarcity mindset, you think that, you know, there's already enough of that. But the 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 fact is, is her community knows her and she is a resource for them and she mm-hmm. is an authority and they're not going to go and look for someone else to find a similar thing. They already know her, they trust her and they want what she is ultimately going to be offering and that sort of thing. So I think kind of going at this industry in a, oh my God, what's the The opposite? collaboration yeah. over competition, that there is enough yeah. for everyone. And so what if you have another meetup group or another podcast, whatever, like there are millions of people on this planet. Yeah. You can connect to someone. Everyone has kind of a different approach. Absolutely. And I just think that like, I think you need to really look at it as how you can support other people who are doing you know, admirable things and not look at it as competition. And I really also think that 
I don't know, women in general, like you have to decide what kind of woman you are going to be in this world, in this industry and whatever. You're either a woman who looks at every other woman as competition or you're a woman who builds everyone else up and is kind of like a cheerleader. And, 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 you know, I think that that's kind of a big decision that you have to make. And I I don't know, I chose to, I chose to build other people up and cheer them on. Cause I, I feel like when I do that for other people, it comes back to me. I mean, it's literally, it's the saying, like, uh, what it was the saying, like d- treat others like you want to be treated. Mm-hmm. So like, if you want people liking and commenting on your photos, or if you want to make new friends, then you need to go out and like and comment and, you know, send messages and spread love. And, and, and it just kind of amplifies in that way rather than, you know, people sitting down staring at their phone and they're like, why is no one liking my stuff? And it's like, well, are you giving that love out? Are you are engaged? You? Are you saying things? Thank you when people say, oh, you're so beautiful or this looks amazing or, you know, responding Mm -hmm. with genuine things that you would actually say back. So many times I see people commenting on some person's photo and that person isn't even like liking or saying thanks. And it's like, this is, this is actually supposed to be a community. Mm -hmm. You're, I mean, I don't know, to each his own, but. And, you know, I think also too, like people in general, we're thinking about ourselves. And so really when I'm going on Instagram, I'm looking at, you know, other accounts and thinking how, all right, what can I gain from this account? Like, again, to bring it back to Quigley, like, I know that I'm going to see a beautiful photo, but I'm also going to learn something. Mm -hmm. And so I think as content creators or people who are putting things out onto social media, I think it's like, it needs to be less about you, less about the brand deals, less about look at my beautiful vacation, look at all the stuff that I'm doing, me, 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 me. And it needs to be more about your community. What sort of value are you giving to the people who are following you? You know, like, Mm -hmm. is that tips? For me, it's like, I want to help them with social media. So I do like a social media Saturday, every Saturday. Well, I'm trying to do every Saturday. Sometimes you're a busy lady. Sometimes I don't, but I share little tips that I learned that I know that will help other people. On Tuesdays, I do a travel tip Tuesday. So I'm sharing little tiny travel hacks. So I want people, yes, I want them to come to my account and be like, yeah, beautiful pictures, great clothes, but I want them to leave learning something or, you know, having a takeaway where they're inspired to go visit a country that they would have never even thought to visit beforehand. So it, it needs to be less about you and more about what you're doing for other people. And I think that's where kind of like the secret to success is. You know, again, going back to, you need to decide what woman you're going to be in this industry. Are you going to be someone who sees someone else's success and looks at that as kind of like an attack on your success? Or are you going to look at someone else and say, wow, let me help her kind of build her up and let me learn something from her. Let me, you know, ask her questions, find out how she got to where she is and really have this be a safe space of like learning and growing from each other rather than tearing each other down. And I know that's like kumbaya. It sounds like all stuff, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, it's women supporting women. Uh-huh. It's as easy as that. And it's, uh, yeah, it's kumbaya. But no, it's not. It's actually a real mindset shift that is already happening and get on, tr- on like, get on board with yeah, this. Yeah, get on board, ladies. Like, where, what are you doing? It's you already know? happening. Like, be nice to other people. Support each other. It's so not hard. And also, like, I don't really have a whole lot of drama in life, in my no. life right now. And it's so refreshing to just, like, I am only nice. I am only, like, trying to build other people up. I mean, sure, I say some things. What, who doesn't? But like, who, yeah, right. you say it to your mom or your boyfriend. I don't have one of those right now, but I'm just trying to relate to you. <laughs> at, at Allie Abroad, go find her. She's single. She loves to travel. If you have an accent, please call me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I just think, I think, uh, who has time to be mean? No. You don't definitely. have space for that. No, no energy. You know, when you are talking poorly about someone else, I truly believe that reflects worse on you than whoever you're talking about because what's coming out of your mouth is just yeah that's way worse than whatever you could be saying about someone else anyway moving on (laughs) girls let's all just be nice to each other um (laughs) let's hear about how I swear I looked at your Instagram account one day and you had around like 2,000 followers and next day not actually but it took a lot (laughs) of hard work that's what it seemed like though like 11,000 followers now, which is amazing. And you've been doing this for about a year. So tell me, what's your secret sauce? What's your recipe? Like how, how did you do this other than being beautiful and traveling the world? Stop. <laughs> no, really. Like, well, I mean, you, I think you have some actual, like authentic, genuine stuff here. Yeah. I mean, I remember, and this was still when I was working at 
the TV station, I remember being like, all right, I got to take this Instagram stuff seriously. And I bought a course and um, I really fully invested in it. It was this travel blogger. Her name is Helene in between. I really can recommend her course extremely. I'm not getting paid to say this or whatever, but I was like, all right, this girl knows what she's doing. I'm going to take her course and just kind of know what, you know, what sorts of steps I need to take. And really in that, I learned so many different things, but I learned like consistency is key. And and I know that's like a no brainer, but like posting every day, really showing up for your community. And again, going back to what we said, where it's like trying, it's not just a quick little look at me. This is my great life. It's really like teaching your audience something or helping them with something. And so I think being consistent, I think you know, I don't know how like in depth you want to get with this, but like a hashtag strategy and really, you know, really kind of doing a deep dive into what hashtags you should be using. I think that that's really helpful. And I think also too, like when you are connecting with new people, it should not be a strategy. It should not be some sort of like, you know, bait and switch type thing where you go on their page, you like all their photos and you comment on them. And then, you know, you follow them, but then like 10 days later, you go and unfollow them. Like I am so, and I won't, I, I'll be honest, like I've done some of that stuff. I think we've all tried different things. And and to me, I think, you know, I don't care if I'm, I think right now I'm probably following 3000 people. Maybe I should call that down so I can see different people. But I want to, if a, an account speaks to me and I like their stuff and I want to support someone, I'm going to follow them. So I think actually just genuinely looking at this as a relationship rather Mm -hmm. than like these numbers, like every single one of those 11,000 people is a human and they are choosing to follow me. And I think we get so concerned of growing, growing, growing rather than nurturing the following that we have. I mean, Mm -hmm. imagine 11,000 people in a room what? Yeah. A stadium. Like what that literally like <laughs> right? arena. Yeah. So when I would respond to her Instagram stories, she would literally send me a personalized video back to me or she would do a voice memo back to me. Like instead of just texting a wow, response, wow. she would, you know, record a quick voice memo. And listen, I am all about the voice memos these days. I used to scoff at it. Now that's the only way I text and it is so much more efficient. It is so much more safe if you are doing it while driving, which you shouldn't be doing anything yeah, while you're driving. Drive. But Voice text is a little bit easier. And so she would respond with personalized voice messages, thanking, you know, me for my comment or, you know, responding or whatever, or send a video. And I think that that's a great way to really connect with the people who are reaching out, who are responding to your stories. So I think there's little things that, you know, you can do to to grow. But here's the thing. No quick fix is going to get you to where you want to go. And it is so enticing. And I would be lying if I did. I said that I didn't try certain things like a giveaway, you know, like buying these luxury, like, you know, here's the thing I did. There's like all these weird, like vacation giveaways where like someone will come to you and they'll be like, do you want to be a part of this? Like luxury vacation giveaway, pay $130 so that you don't have to post this video or this photo on your feed, but you can be part of it and people have to follow you. So I did that one time and I, I, I would say I maybe got, I don't know, 400 people or something like that. And, but here's the thing, those 400 people don't care about my stuff. They don't care. They're they probably, just wanted, they followed you because yeah. they want to do this giveaway prize thing. And they're not engaging and they're not the people who eventually will be my clients who, you know, really are looking to me for advice or whatever I'm doing down the road. So, you know, I've done that and I don't know how many of those people are still following me. Maybe they are, but I think when you're just looking at growing your number and you're not really concerned with the people who are actually genuinely following you, I think that that can be a really slippery slope and it can just be really um, rat racy and demoralizing and you just don't feel good about yourself doing that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone tries something and I, you know, I can say with complete honest certainty, I've never bought followers, which feels like such a great thing to say this day and age because not many people can say that. But um, I think for anyone who's wanting to grow a following, it needs to be slow and steady. Like literally just like one of those graphs that you see a line just kind of like slowly going up. Climb. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard when you're in it and you're like, damn it, I just want to get to the 10,000 followers. And you hear people like me being like, just be patient. But it really is. It's like nothing happens overnight. And so you just have to have some things that you do. And really it's just serving. Serving. And yeah, being authentic and yeah, not buying your followers and just offering something that people can help them Mm -hmm. with. And I think 
What's really cool too is how many times we've talked about this, but knowing that there's more behind those perfectly curated photos. Definitely. Which is so important. And then also for you, unplugging, like taking a break from this because <laughs> it is exhausting. How do you unplug? Um, so what, I mean, this is kind of a little bit more practical and then there's some other things. Like when I travel, I kind of get all of my content and I build it up and then I never post in real time when I'm there. I post maybe... I would say usually it's about two or three days later just to really enjoy the moment because you yeah. are seeing the world and you can't be seeing it through your phone screen. I mean, of course it's important. That's my business. I want to showcase that. I want to show other people that who aren't in those destinations. But for me, selfishly, like I also want to experience that. So I for think sure. you kind of have to set boundaries for yourself or even just really being good about when you're on Instagram or when you're on your apps and that, I don't know, I still haven't looked at that screen time thing on my phone because I am actually terrified as to how long I'm on Instagram and whatever. Hours, you'd be shocked. It's honestly, it's, it's I, I should look at it so then I could actually know how to be productive in my day, which is something I'm struggling with. But I think setting boundaries and also, you know, I am a, f- big proponent of the later gram never posting in real time never yeah. really do, like get the content in real time sure but then like put your phone away go enjoy present. that meal actually yeah. have a conversation look at the person mm-hmm. in the eyes like that you're traveling yeah. with or you know speak to someone speak to someone who's new or you know a local or yeah. learn something while learn you're something. there I don't know where you're going to start with this one because this is a big question, but like to someone who just needs that extra little boost, they see these photos on Instagram. They want to make Instagram a reality. They want to go do these trips. Like, what would you say? Like, obviously go do it, go try it, Mm -hmm. have an adventure. But like, what tips do you have? I think it would just be be really realistic with what you can do, what you can afford to do and what you really want to do. You know, I think... I think number one is really kind of carving out a budget for yourself. And that's coming from a girl who literally, I don't know how to budget anything, but I do know that it's important because things can kind of get out of hand really quickly. and Unexpected expenses. Unexpected. Canceled flights. Anything can happen. And I think when you are really realistic with what you can afford and what you, you know, what you want to do, I think that that sets you up for, you know, and, and travel doesn't have to be like this exotic you know, vacation in the Maldives. It can be a weekend trip to, you know, a a city close to you. And and that's where you start. So I think it is, I think we're in the mindset sometimes of like travel has to be so exotic and and I have to be in Mykonos. Yes. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And and that's amazing. I love those places. And I really encourage people to get outside of the U.S. and really see the world Mm because that is so important. But if your budget doesn't allow you to do that, then find a way to travel within your own city. And, and then, I mean, this is a shameless plug for my mom and really the industry that I would like to get into one day, but, you know, work with a travel advisor. And I think people who are our age, travel advisor is like an ancient dinosaur. Like who, what the heck is that? What is that? Why do I need that? I, there's booking.com, Expedia, whatever. But my tip is really when you are trying to navigate a complicated international trip, you don't need a travel agent for things within the United States. You really don't. Unless you're super rich and you just don't want to deal with the time and energy, then you hire a travel agent. But really you need one for an international trip that can be complicated because here's the thing, the extra money that you're adding on to whatever the budget of your trip is to pay for the travel agent, which really isn't that significant, it is, you know, covering your butt in case your flight gets canceled and they need to rebook it for you and you suddenly have this person who's able to help you navigate a stressful situation. They're there to tell you, hey, listen, you're looking at this hotel, but like, uh, it's not so great. And actually, why don't you stay at this hotel with when you book with me, we get you complimentary included breakfast, you know, every day at this hotel. And so it's, it's, situations that you don't expect to arise, it's like health insurance. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like, you don't think these things are going to happen, but you're so grateful that you have a travel agent for when they do. And the unexpected does happen when you travel. And for really sure. also a travel advisor can, uh, you know, it's in the word advice, like, Hey, I think you should do this. Or maybe, maybe don't think about that city. Here's a better place. Or here's, you want to go to Greece, but you don't want to be in the most touristed areas. Why don't you look at this Island, this Island, and this Island. And here's why I like these places. So I think 
working with a travel advisor is good and really budgeting and kind of knowing what is attainable to you. Oh, and I know. Okay, last thing. Get a travel credit card. Ooh, okay. Wait. Yes. Okay, so I am just navigating this right now and I am <laughs> I can't believe I've existed this long without having like a personalized travel credit card, but um I I follow the points guy and he's honestly a genius when it comes to this stuff and he's a great resource and he's kind of figured out how to really hack the whole point system, airline points to get free flights, to get Ooh. hotel stays, to get whatever. And and really it's having a travel credit card. I, I'm looking at getting the Chase Sapphire Reserve um, and, and that comes with lots of benefits. It gives you TSA global, um, global entry, that's which that's one. another tip. Get that. Um, it gives you, th- I think, $300 back towards your travel purchases. Um, there's all these things. And I think if you're strategic about your plan and, and you pay it off, it's not just to put the stuff on the credit card, but you actually pay it off and, you know, you're just being strategic with your purchases. I think you can really build up points and, and kind of get some really incredible vacations with, you know, airline points or hotel points. Or things that you're buying on a day-to-day basis. And mm-hmm. just because you have the card, means yeah. you get free flights. Exactly. It's, it's wild, honestly. So that's kind of... I hope that answered the question. No, for sure. (laughs) Global entry, TSA pre-check, all of that. So what are your favorite destinations? You've been to more than 30 countries, which is incredible. I feel so lucky. It's kind of wild. You hit it before 30, though. A lot of people, it's 30 before 30 or like you... It's, You're killing it. I want to hit 50 before I turn 30. Whoa. Okay, which, just blow everyone out of the water. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's possible, but like I'm kind of putting that out into the universe. But um, uh, gosh, okay. This is like, you know, everyone's always like, I, I can't possibly pick, but I'll pick for you. Can I do a top three? Oh, for sure. Okay. So um, I would say my top three are South Africa. Ooh, okay. Um, I I'll wait. I'll explain why for each of them. And then, okay, cool. So (laughs) yeah, we need to know why. (laughs) So uh, South Africa, just that was my first trip after college. It was a mom, daughter. It was my graduation present, which like, thank you, mom and dad. (laughs) Not your average graduation present. Um, So we went and did safari where we were in Cape Town. It was really my big kind of like, whoa, this is not a normal destination that I have traveled to. And it was just so different from home that it was just really kind of reinvigorated my love of travel. Um, so what city did you go to? Um, so we were in Cape Town. We were oh, in, did you just tell me this? No, 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 you're fine. We were in Cape Town. We were in Durban and we were also in this little area that was called the hotel we stayed at. It was called Bushman's Kloof, but it was basically in the middle of nowhere. And it was, they had like ancient cave drawings from like wow. prehistoric times there. It's like so interesting to see how old some places in the world are. It's it's just wild. So That's amazing. That's on my bucket list. Girl, you've got to sure. go. South Africa, I think, is a great entry point into the country of Africa in general. Just I think it's like, I don't know, it gives you a really good sense of the destination. And kind of from there, you can kind of spark your interest in what other countries you want to go to from and there. And such incredible history too. So, all right. So, South Africa, um, Greece is, uh, uh, and it's such a. I feel so basic saying Greece because it's like every you know, girl is like Greece, Mykonos, Santorini, but it literally is the most beautiful, relaxing, gorgeous place. Great food, hot men. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say the food is amazing. Yeah, don't comment men on the are men, bad Sarah. Either. You know, I have you, a boyfriend. You know, don't comment. You don't need to comment on that. But um, <laughs> it just—it's a great place to go to really unwind. And there's so many other um, islands aside from just Mykonos and Santorini that are worth exploring. That really give you a kind of great taste of what the culture is all about. I mean, it's stunning. I mean, if you need to be sold on it, just go Google a picture of Greece. Literally. Go do it. Uh, yeah, it's, Santorini, Mykonos. It's incredible. And your cat is named Mykonos I know. after Mykonos. So. I'm a crazy cat lady. Four cats. They're all named after my favorite places that I've traveled. So we've Wait, got- Wait, I think I know. Palmer. Okay. Yes. So that's for Palm Springs. Okay. Mykonos. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Who are the other two? So it's so Cam- I just knew Paul- Camden, Camden, which is Camden Town in London, where I lived in college. And then this is the weirdest one. I just uh, so oh I can't I can't believe I forgot this too about South Africa. Okay, Stella is short for Stellenbosch, which is the wine country in South Africa, which is literally oh God's God. earth. Like oh, it's so wow. beautiful. Great I'm wine, all about wine, beautiful mountains, so green. It's incredible. 
Stellenbosch and I think it's Franschuk is kind of how you should say it. That's wine country in South Africa. It's incredible. Okay. That's where I'm going to next. Great. And then my last country is India. Ooh, and wow, I, it's a, it's, I would, I would say it's a country that you, it's not your first out of, out of America experience. I wouldn't recommend it. I think India is a country that you t- t- tackle when you've, when you're a seasoned traveler and, when you're and ready. That's, yeah. And, and I think that's just, that's not to be negative, but it's just to really manage expectations and be ready to handle something like that because you are seeing things that you've never seen before and you just kind of need to be ready for that. And I think you need to be experienced and, and also to be, you know, respectful of culture and all of that. I mean, there's so much there. Definitely. But it is beautiful. And the people there, I mean, I could go on about Indian culture and hospitality and they're just so wonderful and they're known for their hospitality. And I really think that for people who are curious, I think they should go. Yeah, I think your destination guides and the just stories that you share from those trips in India are just fascinating. Like the pictures are amazing, but also the experience when you were talking about the, you know, sacred rituals that you were experiencing and seeing and the clothing, like that was just, to me, that really, I mean, I've always loved your, your blog and what you're doing, but that truly is an example of learning something about a culture when so many times on Instagram you see photos of these amazing Mm -hmm. you know sacred places but I'm like what is this where is this like tell me more and you don't get that on some Instagram accounts but with yours it's like let me break down this history or this is what a local told me and I think that's fascinating and totally makes your content stand out from the rest. Thank you. I think that's where our journalism background comes in because you know, we know how to take beautiful photos, but it's also storytelling. And that's at the core of everything. You know, I really love storytelling. And I think that that no matter what job I have, I think that that really comes through. And so I think for Americans, you know, I want to break down the barriers and and the stereotypes that, you know, even to this day, I say India is my, one of my favorite countries and people are like, really? Why? I have no interest in going there. And I think a lot of people in certain, about certain countries or cultures have a lot of stigmas. And I think going there and saying, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm learning. Look at these things is a really important thing for people who are traveling to kind of share with other people to, You know, not everyone needs to go to India. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, but I do think that people should be open to learning about different cultures. And, and I think that's the compassion that we need. We're in need of more compassion and just kind of being able to look at other cultures and not see them as other, but seeing everyone as kind of like a learning opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not other, but to embrace the differences and just, this is how people live. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Social media has a lot of pitfalls, but there's also amazing things that bring mutual understanding and friendships. And in our discussion, we've covered so many things from travel to careers Mm. to friendships. (laughs) And I guess my question I ask every single guest is if you could go back when you were starting this defining decade of the 20s, if you could go back and tell yourself something, if there's a piece of advice that you could share, some, you know, parting wisdom that you could give that could help other girls, what would that be? I don't know. I would just say, Take the time in your 20s to really figure out who you are and and really look at this as like a growing and learning opportunity and give yourself the grace of not feeling like you need to know exactly what the hell you're doing. Because I think we get so caught up in our 20s being like, oh, I need to, you know, do this, 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 this. I need to have achieved this by this X date. And like, you know, you get so caught up with whatever life goals that you would set for yourself when you're in college or in high school or whatever. And I think your 20s is to figure it out and just learn and grow and test and try and figure out what you do want to do for the rest of your life because you're in your 20s. You have like, I mean, theoretically, if you're going based off of when people retire, you've got like 45 years of work ahead of you. So like, yeah, I mean, you want to make it good. uh, Yeah, you got, that's a long time to be working. And so you want to make sure that what you are devoting your time and energy to is something that you are passionate about. So, you know, I made a pivot when I was what, I was 20, 26. So like, it, it was in it's my never 20s. Too late. It's never, I mean, yeah, it's never, my mom started being a travel agent when she was 50 something, 55. She didn't do this before. She was in banking. Like you're, it's never too late to 
pursue your passion or make a pivot or whatever. And I think your 20s is when you really figure it out and just have fun. Damn, like you're young. Yes. My God, like live it up. You will not get those years back, truly. Go after what you want to. Do that. Don't settle. I think so many people are settling. And it's just, it's a shame because you have the rest of your life. And I know nothing's guaranteed, but don't Nothing's guaranteed. So that's why you really can't, settle. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just you hear settle, you think like a relationship. Mm-hmm. I mean, if your boyfriend's a dud, yeah. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye. Boy, Someone, bye. Boy, bye. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah, settling in a career or settling, I think a big thing, a belief that someone else tells you as an opinion that you learn and take as fact. If someone tells you, you don't belong here, you're not good enough, oh, you're not yeah, qualified, that's good. do not settle for that because you and your heart know what you want to do and that you're good enough and that you have what it takes. So, so much good stuff. I think this is by far like the I most- I feel like I've been in a time warp. I don't even know what time it is. It's just so fun talking to you. <laughs> I know. I love it. All right. New idea. Can we have our own show? Like, Right. Let's make it happen. We'll make it happen. We can have- Combined I don't forces. Know. I just see pink things. Pink and travel and encouragement and just like- Kumbaya. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm so I'm so happy that we did this. I'm so proud of you. Honestly, I just look at you and all the things that you're navigating right now in this time of your life. And I just think that you are on the right path and you're doing what you need to be doing. And I just think that the sky is literally the limit for you. And what you're doing right now is really going to help a lot of people. And I think that's really admirable. Oh my gosh. Or is it you. admirable? Admirable, admirable, either way. Tomato, tomato. You're doing great, honey. <laughs> You're, keep it up. Okay. And where can people find you? Because I'm sure people want to follow you after this. Yeah. Um, okay. So my Instagram is Allie Pierce and I spell Allie super weird. So it's A-L-L-E and then Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E. Um, and then my blog is Allie Abroad. Um, and, you know, really Instagram is is the place for all the things. And then also, if you want to listen to the Clickish Showcast, um, you can follow Clickish. Um, they have an Instagram page. They have a website. They have a membership program if you want to like, you know, kind of step it up. Um, so they've got a great Instagram as well. So really Instagram is the place. And also um, peep the show notes where we're going to include your reel and my reel. <gasps> oh, it's going to be so funny. Get ready. Just a little teaser. It starts out with me pushing aside a big pile of fall leaves. And I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. This will land me a job. I was like, this is it. This is it. Like, I'm going to be on GMA right here. This is the moment. It is laughable. Let's watch. I can't wait. (laughs) This is amazing. All right. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks for listening to the From Here to Wear podcast. If you liked this episode, please download, subscribe, and leave a comment. You can also find more good stuff on the blog at sarahtrotmedia.com, or you can find me on Instagram at From Here to Wear. And please join our secret Facebook girl gang group where you can find more behind the scenes chats, discussions, articles, and community. So thanks for listening. And of course, love always. <laughs>